Hey, how's it going, brothers and sisters? So check this out. For this uh, message today, we're going to talk about the 2024 solar eclipse. Now, this is not going to be some like gloom and doom apocalyptic message or anything of the such that we're going to talk about. Um, what we're really going to do is go through the word of God and look at some scriptures as well as some patterns that could be telling us what we are expected to see, not necessarily on the 8th of April, but in the future to come. Now, I have done some of these type of things in the past when there used to be a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse, and then I would share like biblical insights about what it can mean. And often enough, it was pretty accurate. It really was aligned you know, pretty well with the word of God concerning what we probably should be focusing our attention on in regards to these signs that we see in the sky. So once again, it is not going to be some kind of apocalyptic in time, you know, run for the halos kind of message. It is not at all, but rather you're going to see that at the end of this message is going to have like a twofold meaning, a twofold message uh, for blessings and warning depending on what side you want to be on. So if you look right here, this is a map of, I would say, well, there's only three solar eclipses that we want to pay attention to. Uh, they have four total on here, which is up there in the top. You don't want to worry about that. Maybe it's important, but we're not going to discuss that. Not a big deal. But we want to talk about three specific ones that occurred. And so if you look on the left side of the screen, this area right here, American Solar Eclipses, you see that we had one on the 21st of August, 2017. And then there was one on the Ring of Fire Solar Eclipse on the 14th of October, 2023. And now we have the 8th of April, 2024 Solar Eclipse. Spooky, but it's not. Um, as you look at the map, you see that there is an X that is form x marks the spot and that is in illinois right that is the location the state of illinois it's not illinois it's illinois i get corrected on that all the time but i like saying illinois is because there's an s in it why not use it but anyway uh in the state of illinois and then if you go down the map right boom there you go right here that is texas that has another x now is the x over texas important maybe it is maybe it's it is not, but I am not going to go too deep into it. And then if we continue on towards the map around my head area, let me just lean back so you can see it better. Ah, there you go. You have a line going that way. Well, you can see it forms like an A. And then there is another intersection that is higher up towards the northwestern part of America. So three specific conjunction points, right? Junction points, I would say. Uh, when you look at the map of solar eclipses that has occurred in America since 2017. Now, do these X's mark something significant on a apocalyptic nature? I don't know. But as I said again, we're not worried about that. We want to see what is the biblical message that the Lord is trying to convey to us in regards to these signs and seasons. But before we can do that, we have to go back to the beginning. That is Genesis chapter 1. And so in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, we are reminded that the sun and the moon, they serve two specific purposes. The sun and the moon that was created by God, first off, it is used to give light to the earth, light during the day and light during the nighttime. And then we have the second purpose of the sun and the moon, which is to be a type of earthly clock is god's earthly clock to the people of the earth and so when we go to verse 14 through 6 through uh 18 in genesis chapter 1 this is what it says it says and god said let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years that so that is the first purpose right it is a clock. It is God's earthly clock towards us. And it goes on to say, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the sun, and the lesser light to rule the night, which is the moon. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give lights upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night. And to divide the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. 
And then if we continue on the scriptures, it says that the Lord created the stars as well. So we didn't put the stars in here because it's not relevant specifically to what I want to highlight in Genesis chapter 1. So moving onward, remember that the sun and the moon serves two specific purposes. The first is to be God's earthly clock to the people of the earth. So therefore, the sun and moon alignments in regards to the earth is important to note. It is a clock to let us know what time it is. And then it is also to serve as lights, which is self-explanatory. When the sun comes out, it is lights. When it's nighttime, when the moon comes out, it reflects the light from the sun, and then we still have lights. Okay? So now, moving along. Exodus chapter 10, verse 20 through 29. So in this scripture passage, it speaks about, you know, the plagues that the Lord sent upon Egypt, the 10 plagues of Egypt. And the ninth plague that is taking place here is the three days of darkness. So during these three days of darkness, all of the land of Egypt was dark, except for the territory of Goshen, where the people of Israel dwelled. They had light. And so during these three days of darkness, it says that the Egyptians didn't move out of their places. Everybody remained within their quarters. But there's also other spiritual meaning, like an omen to the Egyptian people as to what this can mean when they seen the blocking out of the sun. But we're not going to get into that, right? Uh, so the reason why we're going through the three days of darkness is because we're about to come across a solar eclipse. And the timing of these events is signaling that we need to be mindful, we need to pay attention to what God may try, may be trying to convey to us, where he may try to give, send a signal, a message to us that we need to pay attention to. So we have the three days of darkness, right? And so the thing about the three days of darkness is that this plague, before it goes, before we go into the last plague, which is the death of the firstborn, this occurred just before or maybe in the beginning of a specific month. It's a very important month. The name of this month is Abib 1. Abib 1, also known as Nisan 1 in the Hebrew calendars. It changed its name because of their Babylonian captivity, but we're not going to touch on that. But just remember the month of Abib 1. So the three days of darkness that fell upon Egypt because of this plague occurred just before the beginning of this month. Now, as we go down into the scriptures, Exodus 11 speaks about the last plague, which is the death of the firstborn. And then in Exodus chapter 11, verse 7, <clears throat> it tells us the reason why the Lord was going to allow this plague, or as a matter of fact, all the plagues that was sent upon the land of Egypt to take place. And so the reason for that is that the Lord wanted to show a clear difference a clear difference between his people, between God's people, the people of Israel, and the people of Egypt. And so it was to establish his sovereignty over all the gods of Egypt and to show that he alone, the Lord, is the one supreme God. All right? Exodus chapter 12, verse 2. <clears throat> this is when we're given the, uh, the indication as to why the month of Abib is so important. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, the Lord tells the people that Abib 1, Abib 1, is considered to be the first month, the first day of the month on God's calendar. Now, you see, in the world, there are many different types of calendars that are being used. We have the Gregorian, we have the Arabic, we have the Chinese calendar, and such and such and so on. And even in the Hebrew calendar, right, we have the civic new year that is on Yom Teruah, which is in the fall season, right? But even their calendar is off compared to what the Lord has stated in the scriptures in Exodus chapter 12, verse 2. When the first day of the year begins. So the first day of God's year is not a religious new year. It is not a biblical innocence new year. It is God's new year. And that is on Abib 1, where it was just where just before the beginning of that month, we had the three days of darkness, the darkening of the sun and possibly the moon and the stars and all this other stuff, right? Hey. Okay. And then when we go to 
Let's see. Give me a second. Right. So in Abib 1, this is when God also gives the instruction to the people of Israel to prepare for the Passover. All right. So maybe it was in Abib 1 or in that season of Abib 1, but it was before Abib 10, you know, before the 10th day of that month. The instruction of Passover was given to the people of Israel, which would then begin on Abib 14, which ushers in the death of the firstborn, and which after this plague, the people of Israel will finally be set free. And it'd be one. So then when we go to Exodus chapter 13, verse 1 through 4. No, not yet. Exodus chapter 12, verse 13. We are reminded of the importance of the blood. The blood that was put over the doorpost of the house of the people of Israel so that when judgment came through the land of Egypt, the death of the firstborn, that plague would pass them on by. They would not be affected by this plague. And so this also reminds us, fast forwarding to the future, about Jesus. And what the blood of Jesus means for us is that when judgment hits, when judgment comes, the judgment of God will pass over the people of God who is covered in the blood of Christ. Now we're in Exodus chapter 13, verse 1. And so in Exodus chapter 13, verse 1 through 4, the Lord reminds the people that this is the day. This is the day in which the people of Israel is coming out of bondage, coming out of Egypt. This is also a day where God's people is coming out of spiritual bondage and out of spiritual Egypt. And so the scripture, it says, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. And Moses said unto the people, remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand, the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. This day came ye out in the month of Abib. Okay, this is why the month of Abib is important, because it's the beginning of freedom for the people of God. The beginning of coming out of bondage that they have been in bondage with for the past 400 years. And so the thing about the bondage that the people of Israel were in is that this level of oppression prevented them from being able to fully worship God, to be able to fully fulfill their promises in God. And so when we look at our lives today, we are, in a sense, in a type of spiritual Egypt over the world. Like, how many of us are dealing with jobs and responsibilities and activities that takes us takes up so much of our time and keeps us such in a state of oppression and bondage that it limits our ability to freely worship God, to freely pursue the thing that God has created us to do, right? So this world is in a type of a spiritual Egypt and a spiritual bondage. And one of the lessons, one of the key indicators that I believe the Lord is sharing with us concerning this coming solar eclipse is for the people of God to get ready to come out of this spiritual Egypt, to come out of this spiritual bondage, to finally walk into the promises, into the purpose, into the destiny that we were truly created for. And so as we continue on in these scriptures, you're going to see more of these insights come together. When we go to Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 1 through 2, and as well as chapter 31, verses uh, 10 through 13, we come across something known as a Shemitah year. Shemitah year. So a Shemitah year, brothers and sisters, is a seven-year period. It's a seven-year cycle in which after seven years, there's a certain thing that the people of Israel is commanded by God that they must do. And so what the Shemitah cycle signals for the people of Israel as commanded by God, is that it is the year of release. It is the year of release that falls upon the Feast of Tabernacles. So on the year of release, the people of Israel is required to reread the laws of God's commands to remind them of the covenant. And the year of release is also a season of debt cancellation. This is the cancellation of all debts that is owed. The year of release is also a season of extreme generosity to the poor. 
Such a great generosity that those who partake in blessing the poor, they themselves shall reap an even greater blessing upon their own lives. And in the year of release is also the year where the indentured slaves, the indentured servants are set free. So the Shemitah cycle is a seven-year period where at the end of that year, there is a release, a freedom, a setting, you know, loose of, of coming out of bondage and oppression and going into freedom. And so now that we lay down the biblical foundation to what we're going to do next in discussing the signs, the seasons that is upon us for this year and probably setting the precedence for beyond. Let's talk about Abib Nisan 1. So now we know what Abib is, Abib 1, the month of Abib. The month of Abib in the Hebrew calendar will take place on the 9th of April, 2024. So this coming April 9th, 2024 begins Abib 1. All right. So this is the first day of, the, of God's calendar to the people of the earth. Now, the solar eclipse, brothers and sisters, takes place on the 8th of April, 2024. This is the day before Abib 1. So when we look at the parallel of what we just read in the book of Exodus and what is happening now, is that we see that in both instances, there is a season of darkness. There was the three days of darkness in the book of Exodus. Now we are looking at a day of darkness on the 8th of April. And both of these events happens just before the beginning of Abib 1, in which we already touched on earlier, why this is important for the people of Israel. And so with this parallel, we look at this map, all right? And then we begin to look at this. Give me a second. I want to make sure I get this right. So looking at this map now, we have this X that was formed over Illinois. I won't say Illinois, but Illinois, right? And so in this X that was formed over Illinois, the location specifically in Illinois in which this X falls on is at a place called Carbondale, Illinois. So this X falls in a location in Illinois called Carbondale, Illinois. So why is this important? It is important because the nickname of that specific area is Little Egypt. Little Egypt. So this X right here, I got it this time, right here, falls upon a territory called Little Egypt. So back in 2017, when there was a solar eclipse, it passed through this region, this territory known as Little Egypt. And then in 2024, seven years later, it once again crosses through the exact same area called Little Egypt. And so you can go ahead and do some research and find out that this name, this nickname, dates back to 1799. And there's like a, a cool story behind it, how they related to Egypt and the Nile and et cetera, et cetera. Feel free to go ahead and do it on your off time. As for me, let's press on. So remember how we spoke about the Shemitah cycle, how the Shemitah cycle takes place every seven years. If you do the math, 2017, well, 2024 minus 2017 is seven years. Is a Shemitah cycle. Now, looking at the months, it doesn't necessarily fall on the seven years. It was like six years in change, but it's roughly around the same season. So that same year, these eclipses ha happen when it comes to a seven-year cycle, even though the months may be a little different. So looking at this connection, Shemitah year, the year release, an X over a place called Little Egypt, going through the book of Exodus, and all that we just learned about that, this is a sign, brothers and sisters, that we need to pay attention to. Now, there was a third eclipse that I told you that we're going to pay attention to. And this is the one from, if you look, it's 14th of October, 2023, an annular solar eclipse, also known as the Ring of Fire, because it's a ring of fire when the moon goes and covers the sun. The Ring of Fire, as you see here, ugh, there you go, 
that I'm, we'll, we'll make it work. There you go. Turn it this way, that way. Knife. Ah, there you go. No, the other way. All right. So you guys get it. You guys get it, right? So that ring of fire, which goes through Texas, forms another X, another marking. Why is this important? So some of you who've done some research and been looking at looking up the 2024 April solar eclipse would have come across the knowledge that it forms two Hebrew alphabets. So the first one, the first alphabet is Aleph, which is the first letter of the Hebrew, Hebrew alphabet. The next you have Tav, which is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So the two Hebrew words that we have is Aleph and Tav. The first letter and the last letter for 22 letters in the alphabet. So with these with these two put together, what the spiritual meaning you can get from these letters is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. When we look at it from a Shemitah standpoint, brothers and sisters, this Shemitah cycle began in 2017 and end, ends on, the two, on 2024. So the seven-year cycle had a beginning, 2017, and an ending, 2024. Aleph, Tav, beginning, end. Alpha, Omega, and et cetera. So up to this point, you can see, brothers and sisters, is that the Lord is trying to get our attention. Little Egypt, seven-year Shemitah cycle, Aleph, Tav, Alpha, Omega, beginning, end. All these different things is coming together as a sign to let us know that we are approaching a very important moment on God's earthly clock that he organized through the sun and through the moon. We need to be paying attention from here on out to what the Lord may try to be communicating to each and every one of us individually and holistically as a church and apparently for America. So now we're going to conclude this by looking at one important message that we just learned, right? That we could put this all together and sum it all up. Is we have the story of Joseph. So for many of us, right, we remember the story of Joseph about the dream that Pharaoh had, and Joseph was able to interpret the dream. Seven years of lean, well, seven years of fat, seven years of lean, seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. And so when we go to Genesis chapter 41, this is what it says. Verse 53, then the seven years of plenty, which were in the land of Egypt, ended. And the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. The famine was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, check this out, go to Joseph. Whatever he says to you, do. The famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. So all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all lands. So here is the bottom line, brothers and sisters, that we have to prepare for a famine that is coming. Famine of bread, maybe. Famine for the word of God is in the scriptures. There'll be a famine in the land for the word of God. There is a famine that is coming, which means that there are hardships that is coming since the seven years of plenty may have be, been may be at an end. It also tells us that we need to prepare for the wilderness. 
like the people of Israel who is led out of bondage, led out of Egypt, which means that there's going to be some things, brothers and sisters, that may be shaken in our lives, that may be broken off in our lives that is preventing us from being fully dedicated to the purposes, to the world, to the things of God. So the people of God need to prepare for a shaking in their lives to remove the things that doesn't belong so that the things of God may remain. This is also a season for the people of God to prepare for favor and to be used by God for his glory as it was with Joseph, as it was with Moses in the stories. Because you see, it says that Joseph was the one who opened up the storehouses. It was Joseph and whom Pharaoh commanded the people to go to receive instructions. So it means that the people of God need to be ready to be used for this time, for the people will be coming to the people of God for answers, for help. And as we said that the Shemitah year is a time of generosity for the poor, both in the physical and spiritual. So as Joseph, we need to be prepared, brothers and sisters, to show great generosity in the spirit and joy and great generosity in the natural. And so also we need to prepare for this to be a year of release from bondage. We spoke about that earlier. Is that things that we have been bound in in this spiritual Egypt of the world, be prepared to be set free from that to be used by God. This is a year of debt cancellation because when we are in a type of debt, whether it's in our spirit, whether it's in our mind or in a natural, economic, whatever, when we are in debt, we are limited, we are in bondage, we are unable to move forward because we have something that is chaining us back. So prepare for the Lord to move to release the debts that has been upon the people because of decisions that was made in the past, because of things that we did that we now regret that we're still having to deal with the consequences for, for it, especially in our minds and in our spirits. So prepare for this to be a year of freedom and new beginnings for the church. Prepare to be used, for this is the time for the kingdom of God to arise. This is a time for the church of God to arise. But before there is the rising, there must be the shaking, the shaking off of the things that does not serve the purpose of God in your life. That above all things, you must understand that the Lord will not do anything unless we give him our yes and amen. So in concluding, this message, my prayer for each and every one of us, is that upon hearing this word, that we will really count the cost of our discipleship, that we really take this into our prayer closet and seek the Lord's face about what I'm sharing with you, and be willing to give God our yes and amen for whatever he decides and all the things that he desires to do in our lives. All right, brothers and sisters, this is all that I have for you. I pray that this gives you some insights about the 2024 April 8th eclipse. There's a lot of videos that's being that's out there um, about this, but I thought I'd share this with you from what I believe the Lord has deposited in my spirit in a spiritual sense for you to help you have some, wis some wisdom and how to properly navigate this. On the 8th of April, am I saying something supernatural is going to happen? No, maybe something will. I don't know. But my job here is to give you the spiritual food to what we can expect when it comes to the signs of God. Love you all. Catch you next time. And God bless.